Well, Gorman's Rock Church, how are we doing today? Woo! So good to see you. The snow is here and we're still alive. Woo! Awesome. All right. Well, uh, I am Jason Rates. I happen to be the pastor here at Thrive, and I'm so glad that you joined us. You braved the weather, and we are here together. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live. I don't know about you, but there is just something powerful about God's Word. And I know in my life, there are times when uh, it has just sat dormant in my life. And I'm not proud of that, but I'm someone, maybe you can relate, uh, I grew up with Christian parents. Uh, my parents tortured me as a kid. We played Bible trivia all the time. <laughs> Nothing says family fun night. I just wanted to watch uh, Different Strokes. <laughs> or I wanted to watch uh, Cheers, or I wanted to watch, oh, who's the Michael J. Fox one? Family Ties. Family Ties! Ah! Yeah. Oh. Or what was the one with Ricky Schroeder in the train? Silver Spoons! Silver Spoons! Silver Spoons. Yeah. I just wanted to watch Silver Spoons, and my mom and dad were like, no, we're going to play Bible Trivia. And I was like, ah! But I went to K-12 through Christian school, like, my life revolved around the Bible as a kid. It just did, all the time. My parents talked scripture, they prayed scripture, uh... Many of my early mornings as a kid, I can remember walking downstairs in my bedroom and seeing my dad at the kitchen table with his Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, many nights I went to bed and my mom had her Bible out. My, my life just revolved around this book. And then I went to Bible college, and I went to Bible college for a very long time. I didn't need to go to Bible college for a very long time, <laughs> but I decided to fit seven years into, or four years into, anyways, I went a long time. <laughs> and... I studied the Bible even more. And now, coming in December of 2021, I will have been a pastor for 25 years. 25 years. I just can't even believe it. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Wow. One person clapped. Well, I clapped. Yeah. 25 years. I don't, know, I don't know when I got to that age where I could start saying the word 25 after things. I mean, I remember... I really don't remember being 25, but uh, I can remember, like, holy cow, so 25 years. Like, so I've been around God's Word, and I've studied it, and, and still to this day, there is just something so incredibly powerful and something so incredibly sweet and beautiful and life-changing and transformational about God's Word. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, I, I, I don't really use many Gandhi quotes, um, but he said this. He said, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces. Turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of wow. literature. Wow. Like, boy, Gandhi had that right. And I don't mean to beat you down. I, don't want this, I want this to be encouraging and uplifting. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you haven't trusted in Jesus, I'm glad you're here. We actually started this church for you. Because we want to be a church where people who have given up on God or given up on church will be a part of this environment and this place and fall madly in love with Jesus and give their lives over to Jesus. But there are seasons of life probably we all can relate to where this book just does not take priority. If you were to take out all our phones and you were to look up your screen time reports and we were to add them up all up there, and then you were to take out your heart and add up all the page time and add it up, I wonder how much would be, I wonder if Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and ESPN and and whatever you watch, would, would be winning. I know in my life it would be winning. And I'm not proud of that, but it's just, it's just absolutely amazing what happens sometimes. I, I think about God's Word, and I think th this is incredible. Today, like week two of the Bible Project, like I hope you leave here today knowing what the Bible's for. Like what the Bible's for. Last week we started talking about what the Bible is, what it does, but I hope this week you walk out knowing like what the Bible is for. Because the Bible is, is for so many powerful things in our lives. This is actually what Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the New Testament. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Sometimes we, we mistake what we just did as worship. Like we sang songs that brought glory to God. That is a form and that is part of worship. But sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to go to church so I can worship. The reality is, if you've trusted in Jesus, you live your life as worship to him 24-7. <clears throat> and for me, that's kind of a scary thought sometimes. Because God sees me all the time. And he knows what I'm doing. And he knows my thoughts. And he knows what's happening in my life. And yet, I still get to be a part of this. And so, I love what Paul says. Uh, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. He's not asking you to like, go jump in front of a bus or 
set yourself on fire or those kind of things. He's, he's, he's saying, hey, take my every day. Take my everyday moving, my everyday leading, my everyday up and downs. Like the moment you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes, you sit up in bed, from that moment on, you give every single moment to God after that. It can become a form of worship. It can become a place where you offer yourself as a living sacrifice. And so I know for me, I have a tendency to live somewhat negatively sometimes. I don't know why. I'm a somewhat positive person. I'm typically glass uh, is half uh, full. But it's, boy, it's changed the older I've, I've gotten, gotten, uh, and it's just frustrating to me sometimes. But like sometimes I wake up and I'm filled with regret and guilt and shame and uh, worry and, and stress. And so what if from the moment you wake up, you put your feet on the ground, and the moment you wake up, you say, okay, Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are my creator. You're my sustainer of life. I, I, I worship you today. What if we started that way? instead of immediately starting to see what other people else are worshiping on their, their devices. And so we started that way. And then what if, like, you got up and you served your spouse, or you served one of your kids, or you served somebody in your house, and you use that as a form of worship. Uh, Sunday mornings, I typically text about 30 pastor friends from around the country. That's a form of worship because I'm trying to encourage them. Sunday mornings are, are amazing. Like, I wake up Sunday mornings, 4 o'clock. I was up this morning. Most mornings I'm up at 4 o'clock. But 4 o'clock, I'm like, this is great. Sunday, I can't wait. This is ready to go. And then, like, for me, I know the enemy, Satan, he starts to plant lies in my head. Oh, my gosh. It snowed. Nobody's coming to church. Like, it, it's just a reality sometimes, right? We live in Michigan. We've gotten soft. <laughs> I mean, you remember when, like, like, when I was a kid, like, we didn't have social media. Social media freaks everybody out. Like, when, when I was a kid, like, it would snow, like, 25 inches. My dad was like, you're going to school. The bus still showed up. He still went to work. Like, Sunday mornings, we got up and went to church. Like, it just, like, social media now. Last Saturday, I'm in Wisconsin at a camp teaching the 500 kids from all over Illinois and Wisconsin. It was awesome. Thank you for praying for me. But I'm watching social media, and people are losing their minds because of the weather reports. Now, sometimes, three out of ten times, like, it happens. I mean, 90% of all statistics are made up on the spot, so who knows? Like, sometimes, like, it happens. But I'm watching people just lose their minds. Oh, my gosh, is everything all right? Like, Tracy texted me a photo from Meyer, and all the bread is gone. I'm like, is that the only time you grocery shop? Like, it's when, true. I was when the weatherman says terrible. snow is coming, like, we're soft, people. Like, we're, like really, we're soft. We're, 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 yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. But what if... What if instead of like being so motivated by what we see on here, we're just motivated on like living our lives as a form of worship? Can we put the, the verse back up for a second? So I love what he says here. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing God. This is your true and proper form of worship. Go about your everyday business. Everything you do, you can offer as worship. Then he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. How can we not be conformed to the pattern of this world? It's everywhere. What to wear, what to dress, how to eat, how to do this. We're watching videos about this. We're watching things about this. You know, my kids watch these cooking shows all the time, and so I'm always in the background watching these, and the guy's, like, chewing out somebody because they cut a banana the wrong way. The other day I go to cut a banana, and I'm like, no, I can't cut it that way. Like, i got to cut it the right way. The guy's not going to like the banana because it's cut the wrong way. Like, we are so motivated by what we see online. How is it possible not to be conformed to the pattern like everywhere we go. Like the world wants to conform us. You have to do this. You have to drive this. You have to have this. You got to do this. You got to go on this vacation. You got to do those things. And then Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Like how, like how is that process possible? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's how it's possible. God's word is the transformational part of that process. When we fill our minds with God's word, it renews our mind. And what God word, God's word does is it replaces the lies with the truth. And, and if there's one thing I hope you leave here knowing today, it's that we can replace the lies with the truth. And it's possible for each of us to replace the lies with the truth. Uh, I love this quote by Lisa Turkhurst. She is one of my favorite authors. If you don't follow her, follow her social media, watch her messages on YouTube, read her books. But she said this, when the world beats you down, open up your Bible. When the world beats you down, open up your Bible. 
Like, there is just something so profound about that statement. And I know for some of us, like, sometimes us Christians, us, like, veteran Christians, we get into this mode where we're like, I just want the deeper things. Like, I want to know the seven candlesticks in the book of Revelation. And do you know how many hundreds of people have sat across from me in my office, and they just want hope and peace and joy right, right. and contentment and self-control and... They just want those things. And it's it's super great. Like I love I love that my parents gave me a basis for the Bible. I love that I love this book. I love this book. I love God's Word. I love that I grew up studying it. I love that I love talking with it with my parents. I love that I call Dr. Tom and we talk about God's Word. Like I, I love it. But like sometimes we just miss the fact that like we're just trying to get information instead of getting transformation. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when the world beats you down, just open up your Bible. Yeah. Like instead of sitting up in the morning and going, oh, this day is going to suck. I don't know what's going to happen. This is going to go wrong. This is going to happen. I hate this. I hate this. What if you just start with God's word? You just start You just start quoting God's word from memory. Today is the, Lord, the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Wouldn't it be amazing if we started yes. our days that way? Today, this is the day that the Lord has made. I, I remember that because there was an old worship song that went, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, yeah. Like, like I remember. Like, in my church, there was a tambourine player, and she'd be like, Yeah. And she'd be like, She's going to town. But what if we started our day that way? That's how we can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Maybe you're about to walk into something so incredibly stressful and filled with anxiety, you have no idea what to do. We'll quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Meditate. Memorize it. Meditate it. Let it just captivate your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will make your path straight. What if you prayed that every single morning? God, I trust in you with all my heart. I lean not on my own thoughts, my own understanding, but I acknowledge you in all my ways. God, I believe you're going to make my path straight. What if we started that way? What if we started that way? Because the reality is, like, the enemy is going to bring lots of lies into your mind every single day. I wish it wasn't a fact. Like, someone came to Thrive once, and they trusted in Jesus, and about a month later, they're like, I'm done with this Jesus stuff. My whole life has fallen apart. So it's like, I got a part of this church, and I trusted in Jesus. Like, cars are breaking down, and this has happened. Sunday mornings have been such a grind to me. It's so hard to get. I was like, welcome. Like, welcome. Jesus doesn't offer, like, the easy path. He offers the single narrow path, but when you follow it, the, the joy and the blessings that come to our lives are so profound and so powerful. That's why Eugene Peterson said, just follow Jesus like in long obedience. Mm -hmm. Long obedience. Mm -hmm. And so Satan's going to fill our minds with lies. And Satan, oh my gosh, Satan will, will do such a great job. Scripture in the New Testament says Satan is like a roaring lion. Like, like, a, like a, a lion ready to pray. Like, you know, you watch these National Geographic things, and the lion is behind there. But here's the thing. Satan has brought some horrific things to my household. Yeah. Just horrific. Uh, here, here's the reality. You know this. I hate cats, right? You know I hate cats. I hate cats. Uh, yeah, thank you. I hate cats. I despise them. We had a house fire 11 years ago. Actually, a couple days ago, we lost two cats in the fire. Um, wow, that was harsh. Sorry. Um, I know some of you love cats. That's great. I hate cats. And I'm so embarrassed to tell you this. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know how to say this out loud. Um, but my, my household now has five cats. I am now the crazy cat family. You know the crazy cat lady that everybody avoids? Yep, that's me. I'm the crazy cat guy. Yesterday I left my house with five cats. I'm driving down the road. My wife was driving the van before me, so there's country music on. And I look next to me on your side, and there's two campers. Why the heck are there campers out in January? Like cats, campers, and country music all in one day. It was like Satan just attacking. Like, just like attacking me. Attacking me. Here's what happened. I don't have a time to tell you this story, but I have three women in my household who use every tool and advantage to work me down, and they did it well. I was strong forever. We didn't have a cat. Our dog died a couple years ago. I still miss her, but I'm like, no animals. We don't need them. Too much work. I just, I just don't, I don't want it. Like, we had a goldfish. It was too much for me. Like, the goldfish died. Get it out of here. Like, this is enough. We have enough deer in our yard that I'm like, I feel like they're pets, you know? Like, good morning, Hector. How are you? I named them all. You know, Pablo and Hector. I mean, I got the whole, I got the whole game. Uh, and so, 
my daughter, my 11-year-old daughter, she has this way with me. That's just ridiculous. And so her and my wife and my almost 20-year-old daughter worked me down about a year ago. We got a cat. And I was like, okay, one cat's no big deal. I can live with this. I have allergies. But they don't care. Uh, <laughs> they don't care if cat can breathe. Like, what does it matter? That his eyes are scratchy all the time and it feels like hell is in them. Like, it doesn't matter. As long as you're happy, ladies. Uh, I'm so glad. Sorry, I'm getting off track. Um, this was not supposed to be my therapy session. Um, but about five months ago, this little, this little cat shows up at our house. And of course, my daughter names her Minnie, and she's cute. She's little. She's just cuddling. And I'm like, okay, she can live outside. Fine. And I'm like, people are telling me, just pick her up and take her to the woods or whatever. You know, so she'd disappear for a few days. I'd be like, thank you, Jesus. And then she'd show back up. Well, then all of a sudden, three little kittens showed up behind her one day. And these little kittens that looked like little chubby Twinkies, like little ladies. <laughs> they like go to jump off the porch and they're falling on top of each other. They're super scared of us. So then it gets cold and Maddie's like, Dad, and why I got my, 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 my daughter a phone? Like for three months, every single day, 5 a.m. text, Dad, they're cold, Dad, they're chilly, look how sad they are. Like, Dad, we have to do something, we have to save them. One of my favorite authors, a guy by the name of Bob Goff, he wrote a book called Love Does, you have to read it. And he tells all these amazing stories about how, like, on a whimsical thing, he, like, decided to start the school for orphans in Iraq, and I'm like, I want to be like Bob! <laughs> Except, I... I took in four cats, and we now have four cats. Like, I thought this would be, like, a fun story, you know? And so now, like, they just, like, I woke up early the other morning, and I'm laying on the couch, and I'm trying to get situated for the day, and I, I open my eyes, and literally all of them are running on the walls in my living room, just in circles. I'm like, they are possessed by the... the the enemy himself. Like, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Satan put that lie in my head that we should have all those cats. <laughs> I don't want to say <laughs> It's true. Unfortunately, there's this one. It's all white. <sighs> Name is Angel. The thing won't leave me alone. And, and I find myself petting, petting this animal. <laughs> and I find myself purring with him. It's <laughs> sort of therapeutic. Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I watch these cats like pounce on each other, and it's just a beautiful illustration of, of, of what scripture says that Satan does. Like Satan just wants to pounce on you. He wants to attack you. He, he wants to mess up your day. He wants to put those lies in your head. Like he just wants to fill your mind with all these lies. That's, that's what he's about. He wants to tell you that you're not good enough, you're not going to get the promotion, you're not going to be the good dad, you're not going to be the good mom, you can never break the habit, you can never break the addiction, you can never climb out of the pit. Like, he just, he fills your mind. And so what we have to do if we're going to replace the lies with truth is we have to expose the lies. Regret, guilt, fear, doubt, inadequacy, pride, anger, resentment. Anybody raise your hand if you ever deal with any of these? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you didn't. We know that you lie. So, uh, <laughs> come to church unless you're perfect. Um... I love, I, I, I love what Billy Graham said. Like, I've read the last page of the Bible. It's all going to turn out all right. Like, there's this beautiful thing that happens in our lives when we trust God and when we fill our minds with Scripture. Hebrews actually says this in 4.12. Uh, the author of, of Hebrews said, uh, God means what he says. What he says goes. His word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, Laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it no matter what. So, so you and I, like, we need to be renewed by God's truth. I, I wish I was a woodworker. My dad's a woodworker. He builds, like, incredible furniture. Like, I don't, I don't know how he does it. I don't have the patience for it. But um, sandpaper on a piece of wood just begins to smooth out the wood. And that, that's what happens when we fill our minds with God's word. It starts to replace the lies with truth. And so this process, that video, did, did you hear Did you hear that video? Like what happens in our life when we read the Bible one time a week, two times a week, three times, four times a week. Did you hear that like pornography usage decreases and anger decreases and spiritual, like we're, we're hungrier. Like that's what happens when we start to fill our minds with this. We start to fill our hearts. And what happens is, is that process of doing that, it just, it just, 
cuts out those lies. It just <laughs> sends them out, out of our life. We need to be renewed by God's truth. I love what D.L. Moody said. The Bible was not given for our information, but for transformation. Like, I've been a part of a church a long time. I know a lot of churches are all about information. They just want deeper things. And I love, I love deeper things. I, I love studying scripture and the deeper things of life. I just know that Jesus taught pretty simply. Because I think so often we come back to this place where we just start to rely on the information. And that doesn't help us sometimes in the everyday stuff. I know atheists who know all about the Bible. I know people who have sworn off God who know scripture better than believers who have studied their whole life. I think it's a both and. You need the information, but you need the transformation in our lives. Romans 12, 2, again, says, Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Good, pleasing, and perfect will. Who doesn't want that every single day in their lives? Good, pleasing, and perfect will. Say that with me. Good, pleasing, and perfect will. Come on, say it again like you mean it. Good, pleasing, and perfect will. Who doesn't want to have that? Like, isn't that amazing? Like, I want that. I want his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's possible through making it a priority to have a daily time with God. To letting the truth of his word into your head so it could begin sanding out the lies. It could begin sanding out the lies. Because sometimes, maybe just one time a week is not enough. Maybe it requires two times a week. And you need something... <laughs> Maybe you need something a little stronger than just the occasional, oh, I, I heard a verse on the radio, or, or you know, oh, I went to church once this month, so that was enough for me. we got to be renewed by God's Word, because a lot of those times what happens if we're dealing with anger and we, we, we replace those lies with truth, God puts peace in our life. And if we're dealing with guilt, God puts forgiveness in our life, and we're dealing with those. So we got to replace the lies with the truth. Like, think about some of the lies that we talked about. Regret and guilt. Regret and guilt. If you have regret and guilt, go to Psalms 103 to 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according. Did you just read? He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Do you know how, people, how many people don't come to church because they think they can't because of the life they live? How many times people have told me, I never come to, I'll never come to church because you don't know what I've done. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Right. Like you, if you have these lies, regret and guilt, go to Psalms 103. If you have the lies of fear and doubt, go to Psalms 34, 4. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He answered me. He freed me from all my fears. What are you afraid of? Go to God and keep seeking God. Keep seeking God. Inadequacy. Do you have any inadequacies in your life? I wake up every morning and ask, do you know on Sunday mornings, I don't know if I already told you this or I told the, told the first service, I text like 30 pastors on Sundays. I just want to encourage them. Because the enemy like attacks pastors like crazy on Sundays. Because for some reason, like, like for some reason for pastors, like empty seats sometimes translates that we're not doing our job. Sometimes when people don't like something about your church and they say it's not personal, ah, it's hard to take personal because like this sort of job is like all encompassing. Right. Like it's a 24-7 right. right. job. Right. Like a shepherd doesn't like clock out and go, okay, the sheep will be fine. Okay, let it go. <laughs> it, it, the shepherd just doesn't do that. And so there are so many moments I feel inadequate as a pastor. Oh, I'm not as smart as Dr. Tom. Or, oh, man, look at Stephen Furtick's muscles. Let's you know, <laughs> just be honest. Like, holy cow, that guy. But I love inadequacies. Go to the truth. Look at Psalms 139. Oh, yes, you shape me first, then, then out. You form me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, your breathtaking body and soul. I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, like I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life were prepared before I even lived. You, you deal with inadequacy, go to the God who created you and see like how special and amazing and beautiful and the purpose that he has for you. I, I love God's word. I, a couple of years ago, I gave one of my copies of the Bible. So like every couple of years, I get this same Bible. And then every time I teach, I write a date next to the passage of scripture that I date. And when I do my, my Bible reading, I write notes, I write prayers, I put 
post-it notes. I take it on trips with me. Those are pretty worn-out Bible. And so two, two Christmases ago, I gave it to my son, Bobby. And um, I, I don't know if it was special to him. One of my most special possessions in my life is my dad's prayer journal from when I was a kid. I stole it once when I was in Bible college. He didn't even know I stole it, but I saw it on a shelf and I took it. And sometimes I open it up when I'm discouraged and I read these prayers that he prayed for me as a kid. Like I read these prayers, God, would you, would you, would you use them to lead people to Jesus? Would you use them to encourage people? And I'm like, God, like, are you kidding me? Like, my dad prayed these prayers 25 years ago, 35 years ago, 40 years ago. And so now, like this morning, I watched him run down the hallway with his six-year-old grandson in church together. And I'm like, he prayed those prayers that are being answered now. And so I gave this Bible to Bobby. And I, I don't know if it's meaningful to him. Like, I, I see it in his room. And it's never touched. I, I get it. He's a teenage boy. But I wonder someday if it will mean something because when he's sitting with his kids and he opens it up and he sees prayers that I prayed for him and for his brother and sisters and when, when he reads those to his son or his daughter I, 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 just, I just don't know. Like, it's powerful. It's powerful what happens. Uh, <coughs> So last spring, I personally hit kind of a, a pretty decent low. Uh, I was exhausted. Um, my balance was out of whack. I had, had gotten so much heavier that I needed to be. I wasn't living out some daily habits. My back was in pain all the time. Every day was just back pain, back pain, back pain, back pain, back pain. I, I let my eating get out of control. Uh, we revved up to start this 4th Central Michigan campaign. And just so you know, like as the leader, anytime we do anything like this, like all hell breaks loose in my life. It just really does. As the leader, that just happens. Anytime you step into leadership, you just have a target on your back. And so you deal with, you just, you just deal with, it's just leadership. <clears throat> and if you don't think that's true, look at Jesus' life. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. his life wasn't all roses uh, when he decided to step out and, and teach. And so... I just became very emotionally exhausted. And I was just trying to fight through. I really believed that God was saying, hey, that summer, summer of 2019, Thrive's going to be moving in that building. He's going to raise all that money. It's going to be a total miracle. And we're going to move in. And it, it didn't happen. It didn't. I forget sometimes that the children of Israel wandered the, the right. desert for 40 years. That's right. I forget sometimes David wanted to build the temple, and God said, no, it's not, it's not that time yet. You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. there's this process in Scripture called patience, yeah. you know, yeah. Jesus used so many of his illustrations involved farming, and, and I grew up in the city of Detroit, I know nothing about farming, but now I drive by five on my way home, nothing goes fast in farming, like I drive right. behind tractors right. all the time, right. nothing goes fast in farming, right. Right. nothing goes fast, right. and so some of you have been discouraged that we are not in the building yet, me too, and so I just let it like on top of it, and then I, I try not to talk about this very often because it's not so much my story to tell you, but one of my kids has struggled with depression and anxiety in, in the most intense way I've ever seen for two and a half years. Uh, and it's wrecked my life. It's just wrecked my life. Um, every morning for the last two and a half years, between 6 and 7.30, it's just hell trying to figure out the day. Um, sometimes when I look in their eyes, there's just nothing there. There's, there's just nothing. The laughter goes away for months on an end. Um, and it, it's been, it's been, it, it has wrecked me. It has wrecked Tracy. Like it has sucked every ounce of life out of us. And uh, I think on top of all of those things, I just got to a very exhausted state. And I took the staff in June to a Tigers game, which I love baseball. I love baseball brings me life. And so. I walk around the stadium during a game, and so I, I walked around by myself. The staff was having fun, and I was, I was walking by myself. And I hate heights, but I found myself up in the left field bleachers at the way top, which I don't know why I did. I just hate heights. Um, but I was up there all by myself, and the enemy started pouring lies into my head. You're not a good pastor. 
you're not a good dad, you're not a good husband, you're not worth it, nobody cares about you. They just started pouring lies upon lies upon lies. And uh, one of those lies was, as I looked over the edge, one of those lies was just, just fall over. Because if you just fall over, everything's going to go away. The pain, the hurt, the struggle. Your family will be better off. And so the next lie was, take out your phone, and just write a quick note to each of your, to your wife, to your kids, to your parents. And I know this is, extre this is extremely personal to share with you. I, I know I told the line in the transparency thing, and I literally have been struggling with this for a week to share this with you. Going back and forth. I mean, do people want to know this about their pastor? Do, you know, like I'm a human as well, you know, like those kind of things. This all happened within 12 seconds. Here's the thing. I've counseled hundreds of people who have wanted to take their life. I know without a shadow of a doubt that every single life is valuable. I would never do it. I, I, I stepped away. I walked away. I cussed out Satan. I said, you will not put those lies in my head. I stopped it. I mean, right then and there. But it happened. And it, it scared me because that's what Satan does. He fills our minds with lies. And then we just begin to believe them. But the reality is, if we just start to read this, like I love this quote by Shane Claiborne, the more I read the Bible and studied the life of Jesus, the more I become convinced that Christianity uh, spreads best not through force, but through fascination. Oh, like our lives, if we just start talking it and breathing it and living it, if these words just fill every box, if, if we just take this challenge, read scripture four times a week. Read it four times a week. If you don't know where to start, go to the Bible University on the Thrive website, thrivechurchatmind.com. Go to Bible University, click on that link. There's videos every day. There's a scripture reading plan. Just start reading it. Because the reality is sometimes those lies get so, in, in, so powerful. Those lies that day were so powerful in my life. So powerful. Sometimes I think, maybe not sandpaper, maybe not a palm sander, but maybe sometimes... Like, maybe we need to go at the lies a little bit stronger. Maybe sometimes we need to say, okay, one time a week is not going to be enough. Two times a week is not going to be enough. Joshua says, meditate on Scripture day and night. Deuteronomy says, put it above your doorpost. So whenever you walk through them, you see it. So what if, what if instead of that, we just decide... Like, enough with that. And we go to town. And so here's, here's where I'm at this morning. Like, if you, if you are someone who is just struggling with the lies that Satan just fills into your head, we want to pray for you afterwards. Like, just head to the prayer room and make sure that someone prays for you. But will you take the challenge to just start filling your mind with Scripture? Start filling your mind with Scripture. Not once, not twice, not three times. Four times or more a week. And meditate on it. Think about it. Next week I'm going to teach you how to, how to read it and, and kind of get some transformation in your life. We're going to talk about how we can use this, this SOAP, S-O-A-P, Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer, and how we can do that to where like we can replace the lies with truth. And the truth can live in our lives. And so let me pray for you. God, we just thank you for this time together this morning. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you've given us the truth, your words. That we can, Lord God, we can replace through you, with your help, the lies with the truth. And so God, send your Holy Spirit to do that. Transform and renew our mind and replace the lies. We ask this in your name.